Hello there, I'm Shan Harris and welcome to the second episode in our series about Nye Bevan's fight to create the NHS. It's based on the research that was carried out for the audio drama Getting Better, an Audible original. You'll hear some excerpts from this as we go along. Oh, here comes trouble. For whom? The Tories or Labour? I knew I should have taken that bet. Right, Nyland. Here we go. After years of hard-fought battles, Nye Bevan finally arrived at the Ministry of Health on the 5th of August, 1945. The civil servants were forewarned that Nye would be like an eagle in the hen coop. Indeed, the press depicted Nye as a devil, complete with horns and a tail. So Nye thoroughly surprised the civil service by being a first-class minister. His permanent secretary said he was the best minister he'd ever served. There was no Dominic Raab-style management here. Nye sought to stimulate the civil service to do their best work and always back them up. He was also creative and allowed them to be creative. He didn't interfere with detail. He guided the main outlines and told them to get on with it. Patricia Hollis's book suggests that the same cannot be said of Jenny Lee, but that's a different story. This is not to say that Nye did not have his quirks. When he first arrived at the ministry, he complained about the soft, comfortable chairs. All the blood drains from the head, he said. When told that all previous ministers of health had used the same chairs since 1918, Nye replied, Oh, that explains everything. The chairs were replaced, the first of the many changes to come. But the next step was to meet his first-class team. The steps to passing our revised bill, Minister. Ah, yes, the battle plan. Walk with me. And call me Nye, please. We're in this together now. That would be rather unorthodox, Minister. Do I seem like an orthodox man? Uh, No, but I am. Don't undersell yourself. There's a rebel heart beating in that chest of yours. Is that so? Well, you've joined our team. We are thrilled. And relieved. And, as we've established, unorthodox. So, it's Nye, Jenny, George and Wilson. Will? Willie? Good Lord, no. Uh, I don't insist on my title, but Mr. Jameson, please. Oh, no. That won't do. Not if I'm Nye. Smacks too much of school in the colliery office. You'll bring back his stammer. And I'm reliably informed I spend enough time talking as it is. So that's settled then. I'll be Nye and you'll be Will. Is our bill ready for the vote then, Will? It is, Minister. Hmm. We'll work on that. George! You'll call me Nye, won't you, George? Yes, Minister. One of those surprised by Nye was the Chief Medical Officer, a Scot from Perth, called Sir Wilson Jameson. He was a brilliant doctor in his own right and a former Dean of the London School of Tropical Medicine. What he made of the Cassandra-like warnings about Nye Bevan, we can only guess. But Sir Wilson was, his biographer tells us, above all, a pragmatist. He knew that Britain's healthcare required a revolution and understood that Nye was probably the best chance of getting one. Neither was he a snob, like so many of those who had disdained Nye's origins. Nye's family background, education, class, were very different to his own but he was immediately struck by the quality of the man's mind. And he was charmed too. He didn't try to patronise Nye. He didn't try to deceive him. It wasn't long before the two men found common ground. Sir Wilson's biographer refers to their somewhat extraordinary friendship. Here's Clive Mantle, who plays Jameson in Getting Better. It would be so easy to see Jameson as the last man standing of the old guard because he wasn't as immediately rebellious as Nye. He was perhaps more cautious, more reasoned, but he was no less dedicated to a better healthcare system for Britain. And he was, of course, a pioneer in his own way as well. Nye was fortunate in finding a permanent official of Sir Wilson's calibre. He was in some ways a pioneer too, breaking new ground, for example, by speaking on BBC Radio about the prevention of venereal disease, at a time when sexually transmitted diseases were a secret killer the country was simply too polite to mention. Wilson retired in 1950, two years after the establishment of the NHS. 
What a goodbye gift! Following his retirement, he continued to explain and to praise its creation, defending some of its controversial aspects, such as the free treatment it gave to foreign visitors to Britain, a minuscule cost to the taxpayer, but a potent sign that the country was a hospitable place that took great pride in caring for strangers to its shores. On the 10th birthday of the NHS, in July 1958, Nye himself paid an unexpected tribute to Sir Wilson in the House of Commons. Without him, he said, there would be no NHS. The nation owed a debt of thanks to the man. George Godber is another unsung hero of the NHS. Like everyone involved, he had a story of his own that could easily have filled a series, as described here by Barnaby Eaton-Jones, who played him in Getting Better. Well, I think George is the kind of character we could all imagine ourselves on our best day being. He's he's determined, he's honest, he's good-humoured, and he's risen above his own trials in order to play a part in what he believes in. So not lacking in talent or achievement, but, but a, a true team player. George Godber went on to become the longest-serving chief medical officer that Britain has ever had. He was an athletic man, an Oxford rowing blue who'd lost an eye in a youthful accident and who trained at the London School of Hygiene in the 1930s. What was he thinking when Nye Bevan arrived at the Ministry of Health? He was delighted. George Godper had been a key figure in the 1937 survey into Britain's hospitals, which revealed just how bad their physical state was, how short of beds they were and the extent of the chaos in which they functioned. The London teaching hospitals were said to be falling down. However, the real problem, according to Godper, stemmed from what he called the defects in services resulting from competition, if not overt hostility, between the several hospitals providing them. So when Nye Bevan turned up with a plan to eliminate competition and the profit motive from the hospital system and to encourage a national coordination of services, George was fully on board. The two men liked each other too. They were a similar age, and though their backgrounds were very different, both men were change makers. They shared the aim of what Godber called universalising the best. That is, taking the medical care that the wealthiest patient expected and aiming to provide the same standard to the nation's poorest. This became his specific task in 1948, when he was put in charge of a plan to redistribute consultants throughout Britain. When Nye asked whether such people would go and work in South Shields or Motherwell, Godber told him, yes, if you give them interesting jobs to go to. George Godber died in 2009 at the age of 100, just three years after he stopped driving a car and a mere four after he stopped driving a golf ball. There are so many unsung heroes that created the NHS and we say a big thank you to all of them. We'll mention more as we go, but for now, just what was the challenge facing Nye, Wilson, George and their incredible team? I brought this to show you. Can anyone tell me what this is? A tin of oil. A tin of oil. That's right. A doctor from Manchester wrote to me about how these tins of oil are used in the hospital. They take them down the maternity ward and they open tins and put every leg of every baby's cot into the oil. You told him that? Yes. The oil, you see, stops the cockroaches from climbing up the legs and into the cots. The tins are for the cockroaches. This is not just a tin of oil, but an essential tool of modern-day medicine. Although cockroaches are clearly not good, the hospitals weren't in as bad a state as the privately owned coal industry or the privately owned railways in 1945. Coal and rail were quietly hoping to be nationalised, but with one or two exceptions, they weren't fit for purpose either. Shortage of equipment was a problem. In 1948, for example, many hospitals went without any surgical diathermy machines, used to stop bleeding from small blood vessels, because the more powerful ones had been requisitioned for use in the cones of Blenheim bombers as aids to submarine hunting. It was therefore impossible to cut tissue underwater, 
a critical process in bladder surgery, for example. Let's hear from Mark Gatiss, who plays surgeon Mr Kane in the drama Getting Better. It's amazing to think how much technology and equipment have improved compared to what they had then. Endoscopes, for instance, were not fully flexible, so they caused significant discomfort for the patient and were difficult to use, even with skilled hands. A patient having a gastroscopy was held as rigidly as possible while the physician passed through the throat, down the esophagus, or gullet if you prefer, and into the stomach, hoping not to cause any tissue damage on the way down. Sometimes the endoscope's small light source failed at the crucial moment. The hospital buildings were hardly attractive either. Two-thirds had been erected before 1890 and almost a quarter before 1860. Most had that institutional Victorian look, more like a barracks or a workhouse than a hospital. A good many were dirty and obviously unhygienic. As highlighted by Ava in her fictional letters to Nye, at Paddington General, the legs of the cots on the maternity ward stood in tins of oil to deter cockroaches from crawling up and bothering babies. A good many of the buildings lacked diagnostic facilities, pathology or radiology. Most were without an operating theatre. The heating systems were primitive, and often the ancient boilers would be turned off at night to save money. Even here, most of the boilers had been installed in the late Victorian period and were coming to the end of their natural lives. To replace them would involve enormous cost. Compared with today, there were few drugs to offer. Salicylates for rheumatic fever, digoxin for heart disease sulfonamides for pneumonia. Your typical hospital ward would be full of elderly patients with chronic illnesses. Treatment centred on bed rest, barbiturate sedation at night and nursing. Anaesthetics was not yet a distinct speciality and basic knowledge of its techniques was expected in any doctor. A house surgeon who happened to be having a biscuit and a cup of tea might easily be summoned to a labour ward to anaesthetise a patient for an emergency forceps delivery or caesarean section. Before 1940, most hospitals remained refuges for the chronically sick and elderly. Drug treatments were simple and surgical procedures were limited. Time spent in hospital mostly involved bed rest and nursing care. From 1940, however, the reality of World War II shifted the public and political perceptions of hospitals, beginning with the creation of the Emergency Medical Service. Initially, this meant discharging thousands of patients to make way for those wounded during fighting and bombing campaigns. The immediate impact of this was to export disease across the country, a pandemic from which we appear to have learned little 80 years later. But over time, wartime organisation had the positive impact of coordinating services nationally, including modern blood transfusion methods, improved radiology, pathology, anaesthesia, and antibiotics. Surgeons were now able to specialise in trauma techniques, plastic surgery and burns treatment. People everywhere could see how a national system of working together could revolutionise healthcare. The advances made during the First World War had not, however, been properly sustained. The golden promises made for life after the war didn't materialise, even when the plans were produced. In 1919, the first British Minister of Health, Christopher Addison, commissioned a report from the then physician to King George V, Dr Bertrand Dawson, first Viscount of Penn. This interim report was on the future provision of medical and allied services and provided detailed plans for a network of primary and secondary health services. It took another 28 years for much of this plan to be implemented Many British people were determined that the same must not happen after the Second World War. Interestingly, Lord Dawson is now perhaps best known for his part in the death of George V. He surreptitiously injected the king with a fatal dose of cocaine and morphine, allegedly so the king would die in time for an announcement in the morning papers. He didn't acquire patient consent. It was illegal at the time and possibly constituted murder an event that certainly underlines the need for robust governance and education for doctors across the board. The Good Enough Report in 1944 highlighted the number of practising doctors whose medical education had been rudimentary at best. 
Some had begun their careers as apprentice surgeon apothecaries. A properly planned and carefully conducted medical education, the report stressed, was the essential foundation of a comprehensive health service. Every hospital should be associated with a university teaching hospital, and teaching itself should place equal emphasis on patient care, research and students. But there was also another problem that the report shed light upon. Why is this patient not in surgery? One of yours, Hughes? No. Yes. Ah, you must be our new lady physician. Are you the reason for the hold-up? I was expecting the patient upstairs. A sluggish first day doesn't bode well for the future, does it, doctor? The Good Enough report highlighted that some medical schools, particularly in London, did not enrol women students. It finally stipulated that gender should not be a barrier to a medical career. Women had provided huge support as doctors during the First World War, but between the wars, access to training became more difficult. This was finally deemed unacceptable after the Second World War, and all medical schools were compelled to accept female students by 1947. Here's Catherine Drysdale, who plays Ava in Getting Better. Dr Eva Calloway may be a fictional player in our story, but she is, we hope, a representation of the real women of the NHS and of Britain after the war. A powerful intellect, tempered by compassion, a determined and adept practitioner of medicine, someone who has suffered loss in the war and yet must find a way to move forward. Yet it is impossible to tell her story, sadly, without touching on the many hurdles she has to overcome, from the rampant misogyny that we have still yet to eradicate entirely to the specific prejudices that affect Eva as an unwed mother. Although the figures are inexact, it would seem that roughly only 10% of doctors in Great Britain were women in 1945. Much of this was due to the entry barriers to the profession, it was only after a funding review in 1947 and then the inauguration of the NHS in 1948 that all medical schools were obliged to take female medical students. The London School of Medicine for Women was the first medical school in Britain to train women as doctors when it was established in 1874. It soon had a relationship with the Royal Free Hospital, enabling the trainees to complete their clinical studies. In 1896, the school was officially renamed the London Royal Free Hospital School of Medicine for Women. Needless to say, the rarity of women in medicine, or indeed in many professional spheres, made the lives of Ava's real-life counterparts extremely difficult. Was there something I can get for you, Doctor? I think Nurse Wallace is about to finish her last shift. I just wondered if you wanted to say goodbye. Oh, she won't want me there. She'd have to be on her best behaviour. <laughs> We've said our farewells. I'll let her have a last moment with her friends in peace. It must be hard seeing them go. Try not to get too attached. We lose most of them. Lose? Oh, let's just say bedpans and bombed-out hospitals aren't nearly as attractive as the uniform. And then there's the rest of it. The rest? Oh, she was just starting to shape up, was young Florence. Then along comes Mr. Wright, or at least Mr. Wright enough. God save us from the ringing of church bells. Ever since the men came back, we've been losing staff hand over fist. And there's too few of us as it is. Not enough girls in England to do what's needed. We're fighting a losing battle. The key battles when creating the NHS were between politicians and doctors and form the focus for the rest of the story. However, this doesn't disregard the importance of nurses. As Nick Thomas Simmons highlights, Nye's 1947 Labour Party conference speech focused on the nurses rather than the doctors, expressing the need to improve their pay and conditions, and the need for sufficient numbers of them in order to run the NHS. Jenny remembered taking some flowers to a friend at St Teresa's, a small Catholic hospital in Wimbledon. She intended to just pop in while Nye waited in the car to drive them home. However, a nurse recognised him, and there was immediately a general flurry. Sister Agnes, the matron, turned around and said, You know, Minister, you are the most hated man in Great Britain. Then after a slight pause, And the most loved. Sister Agnes badly needed more beds, staff and supplies, 
she believed that God had sent Nye to answer her prayers. As we'll see, nursing overall welcomed the introduction of the NHS. Here's Charlotte Jacob Hall, a real-life modern-day registered nurse, to explain more. Central to all healthcare is nursing and nursing assistance. Conditions were not ideal for nursing in 1945, but there was always a continued push towards improving the quality of care via training. Even one of Nye Bevan's most determined antagonists, Lord Horder, did much to improve nursing. In our story, Flo Higson leaves the profession when she gets married. This is true to the attitude and practice of the times, which meant that the nursing profession remained, on the whole, very young, apart from stalwarts such as Matron Unsworth. The NHS has continued to provide opportunities and growth for improvement and 2020 was named the Year of the Nurse and Midwife. But with the coronavirus pandemic, it was not exactly the sort of year that nurses and midwives were expecting. It was, nonetheless, a powerful reminder of what they accomplished daily. So the truth is, with all the evidence in front of them and the opportunities created as a result of the war, both Labour and the Tories accepted that some form of National Health Service was necessary. The best-selling beverage report had been passed by Parliament and outlined plans had been put together firstly by the doctors themselves and then by the wartime coalition government. Why then the bitter battle? What was it about Nye's own plan and Nye himself that was deemed so impalatable? To understand the dilemma, we firstly need to remember the three major principles that served as the foundation of the NHS. Firstly, the health service should be comprehensive, offering everything from GP appointments, hospital care, dental treatment, mental health and new spectacles. Secondly, that any new service should be universal, covering not just a few, but 100% of the British people. Thirdly, as outlined by Beveridge, the health service should be free at the point of use, funded by us as taxpayers over a lifetime, rather than by ill or injured people in dire need of medical treatment and attention. Nowadays, politicians use principles or tests for joining the euro or red lines for Brexit as a way of not doing something. Between 1945 and 1948, Nye used these tests to actually make the health service work in practice. So in 1945, Nye inherited the Tory minister, Henry Willink's plan. Gracious too, as advertised. The trouble is now the war is over, we've all become small. Small change. All we have left are concessions and deficit. Our nurses and medical students are forced to play dress-up in comical attire and rattle their collection boxes on railway platforms, begging for small change to keep the hospitals afloat. We have an opportunity here, Sir Wilson, and with your help, I think we can do a lot better than small change. I couldn't agree more, and I must say I'm very much looking forward to working with a minister who knows how to get things done. You have the proposal. I read it at the weekend. Extremely thorough, accurate to a fault, and clear evidence of a fine legal mind at work, complete with the aversion to risk. It avoids unnecessary conflict, if that's what you mean. Everyone gets what they want. Precisely. And precisely no one gets what they need. That proposal is the result of multiple cross-party consultations and, while, yes, some of the elements of the proposal may not be exactly to everyone's taste, we have reached a modus vivendi. A way of life? Yes. I'm sorry, but I don't agree. With all due respect, a way of life is the polar opposite of what you've achieved here. Which is why I'm throwing the damn thing in the bin. Mr. Bev and I, for God's sake. In February 1944... Henry Willink produced a white paper, a governmental guide designed to explain complex issues, entitled A National Health Service. Its stated aim was to explore a comprehensive medical service, free of charge to all who wished to use them. Obviously, this in itself was a huge step forward. However, in Willink's version, no patient or doctor would be forced to join the new service. Private practice would continue on a substantial scale, Central responsibility would rest with the health minister while being advised by expert professional bodies. 
And in what would become a key battleground, a National Health Service proposed that the planning of hospitals over regional areas would be entrusted to joint boards of grouped local authorities and they would take over the municipal institutions only. The voluntary hospitals could choose whether or not to join the service and even proposed a halfway status whereby they would receive public funds in return for a partial submission to the joint boards. As Michael Foote states, we cannot know whether Willink planned to pay for this plan via taxation, national insurance or a separate insurance scheme, as the Tories lost the election before this decision could be made. Nonetheless, this plan received wholehearted support from the House of Commons during the war. No timescale was set in place. However, there was no expectation that it would happen quickly. Meanwhile, the doctors' bubbling anxiety about any sort of health service turned to panic. They saw a future of doctors as civil servants and slaves to the state. Even under Willink's less comprehensive plan, private practice could only survive as a shadow of its former self. With the doctors against it, and thanks in no small part to the British Medical Journal's outraged articles, Whitehall retreated. Willink made or agreed vast concessions that led to Labour's accusation that he had betrayed the principles of his own white paper behind Parliament's back. Universal access, the heart of any national health service, was always going to be the greatest hurdle. And for the new service to truly cover 100% of people, radical change would be required. Dr Guy Dane, one of Nye's fiercest opponents, admitted... Those who have spoken in favour of a 90% service appear really to be in favour of no service at all. As a result, Nye quickly deemed the Willink plan as unworkable. He wasn't looking to appease the vested interests. He wanted and needed to make a revolutionary change, something so big that even under governmental fire, its core would still be intact, 75 years later. I know what you're going to say, Minister. You may not believe it, but I am as heartbroken as you about the way things are. But unlike you, I don't believe that denying the facts is a route to anything but disaster. But that's just it. I'm not talking about how things are. I'm talking about how things can be. I'm talking about the future. The Wright brothers didn't look at the sky and tell themselves that they ought to just climb a hill and be done with it. Edison didn't decide he would simply light another candle. The future is born from the actions of the bold, those who can imagine something other than how things are, and through sheer force of will, drag it screaming into existence. You know who else was bold? Icarus. These wings aren't made of wax, Sir Wilson, and they aren't designed to let one man fly, but all men, whatever their station. And if we are to truly win the battle for the nation's health, then we need something modern and effective. And I can dream it, but I can't do it alone. The only man I know who can build that is the man in front of me. A national health service, fully controlled by government? Forget government. That's just the delivery system. That's us dealing with what is. What I mean is one centralised system, one complete and unified health service. Fair access for all, whoever you are, wherever you're from. To surgery, vaccines, mental health services, the lot. That's what the country needs, what these people here need. Now tell me, like the honest man I know you are, can your proposal provide that? The alternative bill that Nye drafted with George Godber was, in the words of Geoffrey Rivett, the historian of the NHS, a work of genius. And the masterstroke, very much Nye Bevan's own, was the decision to nationalise the hospitals. In order to create a service for 100% of people, Nye realised he could not deal with the all-too-powerful voluntary hospitals or local authorities. The only way forward was to bring all the hospitals into one system. It is true that he would have preferred elected regional teams to manage the new service, an idea that still merits consideration today. But at the time, as now, the local authority boundaries meant the location of hospitals and the public need were often at odds. To change the boundaries meant delay, and delay, as we see in the case of social care today, meant prolonged pain and suffering. 
In addition, Nye knew that history showed that when budget cuts are required, local authorities are usually hit first. More recently, this is exactly what happened during the Cameron Osborne years of austerity. Nye knew that the health budget, as the Tories have also accepted, needed to be ring-fenced. Nye actually did cede responsibility for health centres to local authorities. He didn't at the time recognise the need for full centralisation. Those services left with local councils, however, were the very ones that failed to take off. The new nationalisation of hospitals, nonetheless, allowed for effective planning between the regions of Britain and presented an achievable way of tackling the huge inequalities between poor and affluent areas, particularly between the north and the south. With teaching hospitals distributed throughout the country, the London-centric system, including the drain of medical talent towards the capital, was weakened, if not quite defeated. Here's what Sir Marcus Setchell, former obstetrician and the former surgeon gynaecologist to Queen Elizabeth's royal household, has to say. I think one of the key things that needed to be addressed, however painfully and slowly, was that young doctors needed to feel as though practising somewhere other than London was an opportunity rather than a penance for lack of achievement. Doctors needed to reset their thinking. Their goal needed to be to serve where they could do the most good and where they were needed, not where the job would do them the most good. That took time. As always, the crucial question was how to pay for the plan. So revolutionary were the proposals that a general NHS budget could only be guessed at. And how it would work in practice would depend on the behaviour of the public. The truth relied on permitting the public to behave. Most chancellors might therefore have asked their health minister to introduce the new service in manageable chunks. Indeed, the Willink plan stated that additions would need to be piecemeal, and members of the Labour cabinet, including Herbert Morrison, urged caution. But, as Michael Foote stated... Nye argued that the positive psychological and political advantages of introducing the whole service simultaneously were vital. Otherwise, key elements would lose momentum and, or indeed, never happen at all. Nye insisted that additional services, including dental, ophthalmic and hearing services, even mental health services, also start from day one. In his own words... The separation of mental from physical treatment is a survival from primitive conceptions and is a source of endless cruelty and neglect. Somewhat fantastically, the Chancellor Hugh Dalton backed Nye all the way. After Nye Bevan, Dalton was also a chief architect of the NHS. In particular, Dalton backed Nye's method of paying for the health service via direct taxation, Nye and Dalton dismissed plans for an insurance-based scheme outright. As Professor Bogdano stated, Nye had always been very forceful on this issue. He didn't want anyone to worry if they had made enough contributions to an insurance system in order to afford the doctor. Different types of treatment, based on different orders of contributions, would betray the core principles of service. Here's what Nye actually said. In short... I refuse to accept the insurance principle. I refuse to accept the principle that the National Health Service should be paid by contributions. I refuse to accept that. I refuse to accept it because I thought it was nonsense. If you hadn't fully paid up, you couldn't have a second-class operation because your card wasn't full of stamps, could you? (laughs) It seemed to me that the insurance principle had no relationship at all to a service of this sort. So nice to hear engagement and laughter at a political meeting. So the plan was clear. A universal service paid out of taxation and available to all. Nye stated the taxation principle would be good for the rich as well as the poor because, he said... What more pleasure can a millionaire have than to know that his taxes will help the sick? Nye and his team now had a plan for a brand new National Health Service. 
designed in detail to cover 100% of the populace and last as long as people were there to fight for it. With a Labour majority in Parliament of 145, passing the bill should have been easy. This was, however, when the battles truly commenced. Damn it, Minister. I agree. You agree? <laughs> of course I do. But I'm not sure you know what you're up against. Uh, the Treasury, the Tories. The medical establishment. Much of local government. Uh, your own party. You're declaring war, Minister. This could ruin all of our careers and still leave us back where we started. I know. But if we succeed, the victory belongs to everyone. A health service that serves everyone, regardless of the cost. But I need your expertise. I need your ambition. As George and Wilson point out, Nye had to stay determined against bitter enemies, including the Tories, the medical establishment and much of local government. But first of all, he had to win over the cabinet of his own party, in particular the Deputy Prime Minister, Herbert Morrison. I've got rather bad news, Minister. What is it, Mr Goldberg? Mr Morrison has sent round this memorandum, The Future of Hospital Services. It was published six days ago. It appears the Deputy PM has been making plans for his own health service. Well, he'll take the credit and with it, no doubt, the Premiership. He's been leaking it slowly so you wouldn't have time to respond. I have to admit, of the many battles we face, I wasn't expecting to have to fight our own government. There is nothing the Labour Party does better or with more imagination than infighting. And shooting itself in the bloody foot. Which is usually in its mouth. He has the ear of the PM, of the party. If he has his way, our bill is done. Morrison's own health service will be a fait accompli. A compromised health service. A business-as-usual health service. Service. And won't the opposition just love that? I think you should try to win him over. What? Win him over? I want to run him over. Well, the man's an absolute pirate. Deliberately undermining his own health minister, drumming up support, and by the sounds of it, with ease. Whatever you think of him, Nye, Herbert Morrison organised the election campaign. As far as the party is concerned, he won us the country. Whereas our health minister... Is an inconsequential inadequate who stumbled into office so Attlee could appease the left of the party. A nobody. Not even English. Uh, a minor, minor. <laughs> uh, sorry, went too far with that one. <laughs> In his biography of Nye, Nick Thomas Simmons makes clear that Nye's vision was of a service truly run for and owned by the public. Nye's National Health Service would be centralised, including 14 regional boards appointed by the Minister of Health and multiple local management committees. This would effectively remove responsibility for hospitals from local government. This, perhaps unsurprisingly, proved to be a sticking point. Local government had insufficient power in its own right to challenge the health minister, backed by a landslide victory. As Thomas Simmons highlights, however, local government had a powerful spokesman in Cabinet, Deputy Leader Herbert Morrison. Herbert Morrison was the Peter Mandelson of his day, albeit with a Cockney accent. He masterminded the bulk of the 1945 Labour election manifesto, which traded under the uplifting moniker of Let Us Face the Future. Following the historic landslide, Herbert commanded significant respect across the party. His background, however, before joining Churchill's wartime government, was in local government, in 1934, Labour unexpectedly won the London County Council elections, which lent Herbert, the council leader, significant power across numerous public services. His record outstripped the likes of Boris Bikes by some measure. He merged the bus and tram services with the underground, creating what was known then as the London Passenger Transport Board. This is better known today as Transport for London. He also created the much-cherished Metropolitan Green Belt. Nye did not deny that he had done a good job for the capital. But, as we've learned, running London doesn't necessarily mean you can or should run the whole country. Morrison did not agree. Nye had been at loggerheads with Morrison before, but now he had to battle with the Deputy Prime Minister on the very cornerstone of his NHS bill, the nationalisation of hospitals. Morrison's position was that the hospitals across London were already run relatively well, 
But Nye wanted equity of access to healthcare right across the country, something we describe today as levelling up. There were only 30 great teaching hospitals across Britain at the time, and 13 of these were in London. Only seven were across the rest of England, with nine in Scotland and one in Wales. Nye needed a system that could truly have the power to redistribute specialist staff to hospitals in areas where they were really needed. Fortunately for Nye, Clement Attlee backed his proposals. Morrison's cabinet memorandum on the future of hospital services made a number of contrary arguments, but in the end made clear that it was not so different from the Minister of Health's own scheme. Given that, and the simple fact that Nye was, after all, Minister of Health, Attlee felt comfortable backing him. The PM was able to appease Morrison, saying that Cabinet would have further opportunities to review the bill as it developed. As Thomas Simmons says, the Cabinet duly agreed and Morrison was beaten. Well, perhaps not quite beaten. Morrison would try to throw spokes into Nye's wheels at every opportunity. Often, these took the form of procedural points, such as maintaining there was no parliamentary time to review Nye's changes. But Attlee was steadfast in his support, and it was finally over for Morrison. It was a battle won, but for Nye, on multiple fronts, the war raged on. Mm -hmm. 